factories. When a, when a doctor wants to have a new new kind of equipment and, and the one who is who is cleaning up the, the toilets wants to have a new type of equipment as well and who is going to decide. Um, in 68, I organized with, with activists, uh, environmental activists, a, a, a bus tour through Europe uh, against acid rain and I came in contact with green activists from, from Zagreb in Maribor and um, this contact stayed and suddenly um, things changed. I went to Czechoslovakia, I went to, to Poland and then helped in Czech Czechoslovakia during the revolution to build up the environmental ministry and forgot everything about Yugoslavia. Because in my field, on that moment, um, hope was appearing and things in Europe changed and changed very rapidly and we were thinking from, okay, we can build up our utopia now in the newborn um, so-called democracies in the East. And then suddenly you got this, this message from things are not going. I mean, my mother lives in Maastricht and so I saw these buses full of, of women coming to Maastricht and, and fighting for their, their sons would have to go into the army or had to go to the front line and said we had to stop this. And I felt ashamed. On this moment, I, I started to understand what actually what was happening. Because uh, for all this freedom, which so-called freedom, which came into Europe suddenly, one country had to pay. And that was the country which was always our ideal country somewhere in the middle. And, um, and one of these things, what, what happened was the total economy in Yugoslavia broke together in, in a rapid situation that if this would happen in Germany or Netherlands, we would have been fighting as well. No problem. I mean, we are not better or worse than any Yugoslav. And there is the same fighting gene in our bodies as there is in, in the people living in this part of the, of the world. So, and then um, I met Fesna somewhere in Brno. And she told me about these peace caravans which came to, to Yugoslavia and, and tried to make the people understand that they had to live in peace. And on the same moment we had this small problem in the Netherlands and, and another place, what can we do? We can't go on the streets in Amsterdam and say Yugoslavia have to live in peace. It makes no sense to sit in front of the Yugoslav embassy in Den Haag and say you're stupid, you should live in peace. Um, so I asked Fesna, I've got a month um, free time, I can come to, to Zagreb and, and help you a little bit with all these foreigners and find them sleeping places and cook for them and, and take a little bit the heat off from, from you in, in the hope that you can do your work there and, and that I will be like interacting with, with the foreigners and trying to, to explain them that a movement would has hardly got any money themselves to, to earn or to pay for an office can't just feed 200 people in buses which are coming there just to visit and to tell what they should do. Um, a month became almost five years because um, when I arrived um, the first evening I was confronted with, with somebody which I, I thought was, was a pacifist and um, came in in a uniform and he told me that, that he, he had to defend the, the, the village of his, his grandmother and me being a pacifist this was something like shit this is the real um, question which comes up to you at this moment. This is what where you have to decide. What where would you have stand when you would have been uh, when your your village was in the neighborhood of of Jakovo or Pakrats, and it was your grandmother would be uh, 
be uh, attacked. I mean, I was very lucky. I was coming from the Netherlands and I, okay, I spent two years in jail and made my two doctor's duties in, in jail. Um, I mean, this was the best place to study. And no interruption, nothing. Um, otherwise, I never re become a doctor anyway. So, um, I started to understand from the, the most important thing here is to, to spend time with, with people here and start to understand what the hell is going on. With my not being able to speak Croatian or Serbian Croatian, as it's still called, and that was not making it very easy uh, to understand what was going on, but this problem almost everybody in the whole country had, even when they could understand the language. Um, so, really, the really thing was from, okay, uh, Eric came and, and others came and we made non-conflict, um, uh, non-violent -conf non conflict resolution in, in Osijek and we were sitting in a, in a room and, and the grenades, you could hear the grenades outside and you were thinking from, we are stupid, this is not, this is not what peace activists can do in such a moment. I mean, this is going our way. We think that when we teach these people, maybe, what the hell, they will stop fighting. It was quite a, a ridiculous feeling. And I know that my office at that moment where I was working was, was Green Action, and on the other side of the street was a big gas container. And everything, when the sirens went off, I was thinking about this big gas container and, and felt more or less afraid um, and started to write about it and um, I had this, this experience with, with the not existing internet so I was using a very small modem and sent these stories by, by a, a host in, in London and sent it into the world as calling it the Zagreb Diary and not really knowing what, what, what's happening with these stories. Because I was just writing whatever I felt, whatever happened to me as being a normal idiot with a small computer somewhere in Zagreb and somewhere far away from the front lines, describing the situation in a town, in, in a refugee camp, in a station. I mean, this was the moment that hundreds and thousands of refugees were sit sitting in the station here in, in Zagreb, coming from Bosnia, and, and, and where people were sitting on, on Vukovar Avenue in, in a big hotel, and were the heroes of Croatia, and nobody was taking care about them. And there the idea came from, come, let's invite people. Yeah? There is always, in Germany, there is this, this saying from, uh, imagine there is a war and nobody came. Let's change this word and say imagine there is a war and we're going there and we we start to be so many people that they can't uh, go on uh, fighting this was of course a very idealistic idea but um, I was I started to to say come let's let's organize camps with children in refugee camps Let's just start to, in, to invite people from all over the world to show people that they're not alone and to show these children that when you're from different origin, when you have got a different ethnical background, that you not necessarily have to be an enemy of each other. Uh, this was one of the fundamental ideas to have different people from different nationality and show them from okay they can work together dutch people can work together with germans even as long as there is no football involved um, <laughs> and we started doing this and and up to the moment that that um, about a week before we started in um, uh, in hotel uh, Vukovar, as we call it hotel international is probably the right name um, Nobody reacted. There was not one name on our list from people which wanted to come. 
and then something happened which, which turned the situation in the world incredible. There was a little train standing on the border side between Croatia and Slovenia. And this train was full of refugees who wanted to go to Germany. And the Slovenes didn't let them in. And it went on for three or four days. And on that moment, our telephone in ARC started to ring and didn't stop for about four years <laughs> from people who wanted to come and help and do something. Because this was the, this was the most ridiculous situation abroad. It was, it was our war, even when we weren't living here. It was a bloody war in, in Europe. And up to then, in our lifetime, we had wars where black people fighted black people, or red people fighted black people, or white people fighted yellow people. But the fact that white people were fighting white people hit us incredible. It made it so far that all, all the professors and all the, all the people who tried to explain the war here were trying to explain there in the Balkans there lives a very special type of people. <laughs> they didn't took part in European civilization. Um, you can see it, it's all over history, they always did it. By the way, the Netherlands and England had more wars than Croatia and Serbia. Just to, um, to s make it clear that it's historical completely um, wrong, but it made it for us Europeans quite, quite easy to um, to understand that white people were fighting white people. Um, Eric Bachmann came by and said, "From you are using a, a network from England. It's cost you a hell of a money. And I said, yeah. I mean, the money I had with me when I arrived in Zagreb is gone. And from what I going to live, I don't know. But there is a reason to stay here. And, and, and things are happening. Um, and there is this communication with the outside world. I'm trying to explain to people what the hell is going on because the, the newspapers outside are writing their story, but their story is not the story from the people here in, in the anti-war campaign or even the people which are just living here in Zagreb or Osijek and have to confront this situation. The idiocy that, that Yugoslavia used to be an almost Western country with full shops and suddenly the shops were empty and all these things are part of, of, the, of what I wrote in my diary. And hundreds of people started to react and said, For, can we help? And this started more or less, um, it opened for people the possibility to react to help. Uh, I mean, this was the war where you could go to and, and hitchhike from Amsterdam to Zagreb. And um, if you went three, 30 kilometers further on, you were on, on the front line in, in, in um, whatever. Um, and this was new. This was, and, and it opened up the situation that people say, we can make a difference. We can go to, to refugee camps. I don't know how many thousands people came to Sanskrit. It's a, it's a lot. Some of them stayed. Um, and it changed their lives. It maybe not directly changed all the lives of the people in the refugee camps, but it changed a lot of the people's lives who came there. Uh, one of the first things what a lot of people learned was to be moderate to change um, the situation. When, when you came in with the idea, now I'm going to change a refugee camp, you, you were frustrated within the first two days. If you start to, to understand that even playing um, football with, with seven kids or, or learning kids from Bosnia, which are on the island of Raab Rab or Khwar, how to swim, that, uh, that that would make sense. And um, I mean, it's funny if you if you travel to to empty remote villages in Bosnia, you still will find um, children there now, nearly on their thirties, um, would come up to you and speak in in complete Scottish accent. 
and you know, okay, they have been in, in Gasinchi or they have been in Pula. Um, I know which kind of, of, of people were teaching English there and they were quite Scottish. Um, and then the, a moment came that people said, okay, let's, let's do something completely new. Um, let's try to figure out if it's possible to social reconstruct a village. So if we can bring a village together which is on two sides of the front line, and the village was Pakrats, where, where a lot of people said it all, all started somehow. And we went to, to Pakrats. I mean, in, in between the, the whole Samir network was built up with, with BBS systems in Zagreb, in, in Beograd, in Pristina, in Sarajevo, and seven other places. And, and I mean, we have got, thanks to a lot of technicians here also, um, we have got still the honor um, that, that all along the war we were the only working connection towards Sarajevo um, which was a complete new uh, experience people, people could send email messages from America and, and reached out to their families in Sarajevo and, and got an answer and, and there was no other way of doing it at that moment in time um, but this, I can make, I can wrap it up slowly afterwards, because there, and then we, we started in, 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 in Pakrats, and Pakrats was like, deep down, people survived. The war was more or less over, and, and, and there was a kind of, of ceasefire for about a year and um, on both sides of the lines people were there they lived and that was it nothing got real rebuilt it's no ideas how to go on with this situation and there was kids and there were young people and we started to think okay when we can be idiots in refugee camps we can be idiots in park as well so what we are going to organize, we organize youth clubs, we organize playing with children. Um, whenever people on the Croatian side ask us to build something, we will say we will do it, but we will build the similar thing on the Serbian side. And in the beginning I was the only one which was allowed to cross the front line, um, which was, I mean there was a lot of UN cars going up and down the front line, but uh, there was no mu not much people walking. And I, I was the only one which was walking with a red jacket so that everybody could see that I was going over. And whenever I came back to, to one of the sites, they were asking me what the hell is going on on the other side. Uh, is that, that person still alive? And when that person is still alive, can you bring him a letter? Um, so after a while, after being there in Pakrats, after a, a few weeks, a few months, I became, I was carrying love letters in my, in my suitcase or just to, to hide it from the UN to control me at the, at the checkpoint. Uh, finding out that structures which were there for, for 40, or 40 or longer years from people who lived together there for generations, um, maybe were broken up by, by a war situation, but the old context were still there. Uh, most ridiculous came the situation in, 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 in Pakrats on a certain moment that um, Tuchman had the nice idea to bring a, as many um, Croats back to the home country and, and got them from, from Bosnia and from Kosovo and brought them to Slavonia. And people in Pakrats in the pub said, "From can you bring back our Serbs? Because we don't understand these people. They may be Croats, but they have got another culture. They speak another language. We have got nothing in common with them. And we know how the other side, then the other side know how to make uh, Sligovits, and can't you bring some of it? So all this, all this is, all this is, is 
what, what happened. Um, after five years, I was really tired. And um, actually, I, I went back to, to Germany to collect money and more or less find out in Germany, you have spent a long time there and, and you need some rest. And then a very funny thing happened when I was, I was living in a small village in Germany. I saw people in black uniforms with, with torches going through the streets. And I saw it 20 times or something, but I didn't realize what was going on. Because being here five years, I saw black uniforms going through the streets, but they were dangerous. They had Kolesnikovs. And these guys only had torches until I started to understand from, hey, there's refugees in this town, and these are, are the neo-Nazis in the east of, of Germany, and we have to do something against it. And there were, in this town, there were 70, 70 Bosnian refugees from, uh, from Novi, yeah, from Novi, Bosanski Novi. And they couldn't go home, or that they were sent home because the war was over. So I went to the, to the ministry and said, are you completely crazy? These are Muslims. If you send them to Novi now, this is sending them to, to a situation which is not livable for them. And then something very funny. I was talking with the mayor of this town. And we had a long talk in the pubs three or four nights we have been talking about this. And then he decided to take two of these refugees and to take a bus, small minivan from the town and drive himself to Novi and see what Bosnia was all about. There is no other mayor in the world would ever drove with two Bosnian refugees to Bosnia to figure out where the people in his hometown, his refugees, were going to, and if this was acceptable for his belief of, of livable situations. He came back and said, "From no way, they stay here. Um, they stayed another three years, and in this time, uh, the town of, of, of uh, Belzig collected enough money so that we could send all these refugees back to a, a rebuilt house, and uh, to build up a new life in Bosnia and to give them enough help that they wouldn't be having problems with their neighbors of being not inside the country during the war. Um, directly afterwards, um, things went wrong in um, Kosovo, 1991, and I went to, to Albania and Kosovo and Macedonia and spent three years there doing almost the same things. But I learned one big lesson from Croatia. Uh, when I went the first time to Tirana to build up the projects, I spent one month in Tirana all by myself to figure out where the hell am I? Uh, what is this country all about? How do these people think? What are they, their wishes? How they do they think that things can change or not change. And it was a very, very um, practical experience when I learned in Croatia. Because in Croatia, I came with my Western views, with my views of how organizations have to be done. And um, after being teached for almost four years that things in the Balkans were completely different than in the rest of the world, from which I'm still confused, I'm still convinced that it isn't, but at least I, I gave the people in the Balkans the feeling that they are unique and those problems which are <laughs> taking place here can't play, take place anywhere else. <coughs> um, and for the time being, I'm, I'm, I'm just what you call a lifetime activist. My, my, my last big things, what I'm doing at the time is being busy with, with food. Um, just finished a film last year in, in Germany called Taste the Waste, which is about um, the fact that 50% of all the food in the world gets spoiled. Um, and um, I've got a very pre 